So just before we begin, I'd like to read out one message of appreciation. Thank you so, so much to me and everyone who has and is helping out to make this beautiful retreat possible with a boatload of metta from across the sea. That's a nice note to start on. So <laughs> handing over to Ajahn Bramali, who I believe is back. Okay, now I can unmute. Okay, good. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, and let's uh, sort of carry on where we left off last time. We have been looking at this, this a beautiful series of dependent liberation, how the liberation of the mind, the liberation from suffering is dependent on the number of conditions. And, and there's one, one more point about this sequence that we were looking at, uh, which might be uh, worthy just of just uh, reflecting on very briefly, and that is this idea that it is natural, the sequence is a natural sequence. Uh, the word for natural here is uh, the word dhammata, which dhammata is related to the word dhamma, which obviously is the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, so dhammata means according to the dhamma, and, and uh, this, this gives an idea of what dhamma means. It, may, it refers to uh, the, the world as it actually is, in other words, nature or uh, and the laws of nature or how, how the world actually functions. Yeah, so this is a, a, according to Dhamma means according to reality, really, according to how the world is, uh, and therefore uh, uh, according to nature, which is the translation here. Uh, so it is natural that these things happen. Yeah, and uh, the uh, so what that means in a sense is that the word Dhamma itself, uh, the Dhamma of the Buddha, is uh, uh, one way of thinking about it is uh, as nature. It is a natural teaching is a teaching that works on natural principles. So yeah, the laws of nature, if you like it. And here, of course, expanding the idea of the laws of nature, not just the physical laws, the laws of physics or chemistry or whatever, but also to include the law of the mind, the other mental laws, the laws of psychology, the laws of what it really is. The Dhamma is about reality, which is, uh, Interesting, you know, because the other day we had this, uh, someone was mentioning the idea of secular Buddhism. And uh, of course, the, in secular Buddhism, the idea is to take out what you might call the religious elements of the Buddhist teachings uh, and leave it with what people might consider the rational elements or the uh, takeaway of ancient Indian superstitions or whatever people think it might be, and leave it with a kind of rat rational psychological teaching. Uh, but um, this is problematic because it assumes that we already have a full knowledge, a full understanding of the world as it is today. And that is really just hubris to think that we have a you know, profound and full understanding of reality, whereas maybe the ancient Indians did not. And I think it's good if we are mindful as a society and realize our own limitations and we don't kind of, um, you know, that we are more advanced, for example, in the spiritual sphere now than, we, than humanity was two and a half thousand years ago, I, I think would be really misplaced. Obviously not, we're far less advanced in the sphere, spiritual sphere, especially India was a very spiritual society at that time, with lots of people seeking for awakening and end of suffering. You don't really find that in the modern world, in, in any, anything like that. So it's important to take uh, these ideas from ancient India seriously now. Maybe they are true now. Maybe they are in accordance with nature. Maybe this is the way the world actually is. And, and I think it is a mistake to even think about the idea of rebirth, to think of it as a religious idea versus secular ideas. Uh, the question of rebirth is more, is it true or is it false? Uh, it is not a matter of belief. Is it true or is it false? Uh, there might be ways that we could scientifically even find out whether the idea of rebirth works. Yeah, you can think of scientific experiments that might be able to do even to find these things out. And so rebirth, to me, is not a religious idea. Rebirth is either true or false. It is not a non-secular idea. It might fit very well in with secular Buddhism. It's really just a, a, a way of looking at the world and thinking about the world, which either is true or it's false, or uh, you know, or in, in one, one version, 
um, of the in one word version of how this you know idea works. It at least it would be true in a certain way, if you like. Yeah. So uh, the Dharma is a teaching of reality of the way the world actually is, and this is quite different from uh, the vast number of religions in the world. The vast number of religions. Uh, uh, tend to be about things that are beyond the world, outside of the world, like a god standing outside of the world and creating existence, uh, creating the world. Uh, but in Buddhism, everything is nature. Uh, everything is done. Everything is part of existence. Uh, and whenever you see something that might seem miraculous or it might seem supernatural, in, according to Buddhism, it is still within the sphere of nature. It functions according to the laws of cause and effect, according to the laws of the mind. It is part of the broader natural scheme of things. Yeah, that is what anyway the claim of Buddhism. And uh, so uh, it is kind of a different type of religion. And that is why it is based on a, a human being like the Buddha who discovered these things. Uh, because you can be part of this existence and discover these things. You don't have to stand outside it or be beyond it uh, uh, to, for, for this to work out. So, the, so that's the idea of Dhamma. It means something like law or nature or the, uh, uh, you know, the way things are. And so the Dhamma is a natural, uh, it's, it's a naturalism. Yeah? It is not beyond nature in any way whatsoever. But um, let us move on to the uh, next uh, sutta. So one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the points that I always like, like to make are these things, and I just made it just before, uh, and we have seen how this whole idea of liberation, ultimately it depends on uh, uh, virtue, uh, yeah, morality, ethics, uh, kindness, and this kind of thing. That is the root thing that supports the development of the entire path. Uh, yeah, that is kind of at the root of all of this. Uh, so I thought maybe it would be useful to have a look at a few suttas on how to develop the mind or to develop kindness and develop these kind of qualities. So just to kind of to look a bit more at the foundation of all of this. So, and so uh, the first little sutta here is from the uh, beloved collection of everyone, the Dhammapada. Uh, this is verse number 118 in the Dhammapada. And I would uh, recommend you, if you want to read inspiring verses every now and again, just to kind of fire you up and to make you more, uh, you know, before you go to bed at night so you can have some sweet dreams or whatever it is, uh, then the Dhammapada is a great source of uh, beautiful little teachings. Uh, and this is one of those little teachings. Uh, so this is uh, uh, how this verse goes. Uh, should a person do good. Let them do it again and again. Let them find pleasure therein, for blissful is the accumulation of good. Yes. So uh, if you are on this path and you are going to live well, you're going to live with kindness, to do good, to be generous, to be a caring person, all of these kind of things. Uh, then you should keep on doing it. Uh, you should never let up. You should take every opportunity that isn't to do the right thing, to live in the right way. Yeah? You should take every, every moment of life is really an opportunity to do what is right and avoid what is bad. So keep on doing it again and again and again. Uh, and then you have this beautiful little um, a phrase here that to let them find pleasure there, enjoy the act of goodness. Yeah? and see, uh, uh, try to learn to enjoy these things, uh, uh, see the happiness that arises, even sometimes of just thinking a kind of thought about somebody. Uh, yeah, it's possible to find happiness in that, uh, or to uh, just to say something kind to someone. Uh, even the small little things that we do in ordinary life uh, can be such beautiful causes of happiness. Yeah, so see, find a pleasure in that giving. Uh, and when you find pleasure in giving, something magnificent happens, not just in giving, but in living well in general. When you find pleasure in it, uh, there will always be a powerful mindfulness coming with it. Uh, because when you feel joy in what you're doing, uh, when you feel happy about it one way or another, it makes you peaceful or tranquil and all of these kind of things. Uh, and there will be mindfulness there. Yeah, Mindfulness will arise because uh, 
the present moment is the pleasant moment. It's one of the catchphrases I learned from Ajahn Brahm, make the present moment the pleasant moment. And it's nice, yeah? The idea is if the present moment is pleasant, then you will want to be here. You will want to be aware. You will want to uh, know what is going on. And this is kind of the idea here, yeah? The idea, make it pleasant so that the mindfulness becomes really, really strong. Yeah? And when you do an act where the mindfulness is powerful, then you're really aware of what is going on, then, yeah? and you are enjoying it at the same time, then what happens is that it leaves a very powerful imprint on your mind. You will remember that really, really well. Yeah, the combination of strong mindfulness with a sense of pleasure leaves a very powerful impact on the mind. We were talking the other day about the idea of a positive trauma. Yeah, it's because the mindfulness is very, very powerful when you get into samadhi, and the bliss is very, very powerful. So it leaves a very, very powerful impact on the mind, something you can never forget. But this is also true in the, to lesser degrees earlier on on the path. Yeah, anything you do when mindfulness is strong and feeling pleasure about it, it's going to leave a powerful impact on the mind. And this is part of what we mean by good karma, yeah? This is how you make really good karma. That powerful imprint uh, is really good karma because it becomes very easy to kind of bring it up later on. In fact, this is not, this is something that uh, the Buddha himself talks about in other suttas. There's one sutta where the Buddha talks to a Brahmin, a Brahmin uh, asks, the, says to the Buddha, well, you know, I sometimes, all of this, uh, uh, hymns that we do as Brahmins, all these verses that we chant, uh, uh, sometimes I remember them really clearly. At other times, I barely remember them at all. So what is the reason for that? Uh, and then the Buddha says, well, there's two reasons. One of the reasons is that when you learn something, you need to learn it with great mindfulness and care. But more importantly, when you recall things, uh, yeah, you should recall it with a mind which is free of hindrances. Uh, and when there's no hindrances there, when the mind is kind of naturally bright and elated, mindfulness is strong, and that is the time you will remember those verses very clearly. So memory, this is why memory and mindfulness are so closely related to each other. Yeah, on the, in the Pali Canon, we find the word sati, sati, uh, and translate as mindfulness normally. You could also translate it as awareness if you like it. But it also has the idea of memory, mem memorizing things. Uh, Strong mindfulness is equivalent to a strong memory. So when we do good karma, you want to make it very powerful, yeah? Because when, when it lays down a very, very powerful trace in the mind, yeah, we're doing it in the right way, then it will be easy to recall later on. And then later on, when you recall, you sit down to do your meditation or whatever, you are kind of you know, doing things that are feeling a bit peaceful. And then that powerful memory will come back to you. Yeah, you will remember that act of kindness that you did. And then you feel good about it. You start to feel, yay, I'm living a good life. I'm doing the right thing. And then that will be the source for taking this further. So especially when you allow mindfulness to come back in the future, then that mindfulness will allow you to access those memories very easily down the track. So make sure you lay down really powerful comic traces in your mind, and then it will become very, uh, a very powerful source of happiness in the future. Yeah. So um, that's why he says, for blissful is the accumulation of good. Yeah? As you build it up, and you build it up, you build it up, uh, and you're sort of building up the bliss inside, uh, building up all of these positive things. Uh. There is a place in the suttas where the Buddha says to the monastics, yeah, the monks and the nuns, uh, he says that uh, uh, monastics, yeah, or mendicants, yeah, mendicants is Bhante Sudrato's translation. Mendicants, don't be afraid of merit. Don't be afraid of punya. Why? Because merit is a term for happiness. Yeah, if you do make merit, and if you do good things in, in this life, you do what is right, that is what making merit and, and doing good karma are basically synonyms for each other, uh, yeah. Uh, if you do that, it, it, will, it will always be happiness. It's a synonym for happiness. Don't be afraid of merit. And uh, the idea is, of course, that even as monastics, we need to do what is good. If your store of merit isn't uh, strong enough, uh, you need to do things that actually, uh, you know, brings that joy, brings that bright mind into your 
uh, into your life to enable meditation to happen. Build it up, build it up, build it up. Uh, don't just think that morality is about avoiding doing what is bad. Uh, morality, ethics, character, habit is about doing what is good. Uh, being kind, being generous, all of these things. Yeah, then you are on the right track. Yeah? And then you're going to be, you know, building up this idea of sila very powerfully. Yeah? I should perhaps very briefly also mention the idea, the translation of the word mendicant. It just came to, to mind now because we were reading it before, and uh, I don't know what, what, whether you like that translation or not. I one of the things about the idea of mendicants, it is a very accurate translation of the Pali word bhikkhu or, or bhikkhuni. Yeah, bhikkhu or bhikkhuni literally means someone who collects arms. Yeah, the Pali word bhikkha is like arms, and the bhikkhu or bhikkhuni is someone who collects bhikkha, who collects arms food. Yeah, pinda pata. Pinda pata. Pinda is like a lump of food, pata is dropping. Yes, yeah, so it's like a dropping of a lump of food that we, like the monastics do, when they go on arms round, people drop food into their bowls, yeah. So mendicant uh, is the English equivalent. Mendicant means someone who is um, uh, relying on arms, yeah. So it's a very, very, very precise translation of uh, bhikkhu or bhikkhuni. I think that is why uh, Bhante Sujantu has used this particular translation. So, uh, I, Especially if you have English as a first language, I think this might be very meaningful. Maybe if you have English as a second language, it's a bit more tricky to understand uh, uh, some of these words. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is very useful. And of course, one of the most important reasons for using the word mendicant is that it is gender neutral. Uh, very often you read the suttas, they tend to be, uh, you get the feeling that they are very monk centric. Uh, yeah, the Buddha always says, monks, yeah, listen. And uh, it feels like almost all the suttas are given to the monks rather than to the nuns or to the lay people or whatever. Yeah. But that actually is a misunderstanding because the way that the Pali language works is that the, uh, the most senior person present is the one that uh, the talk is addressed to. Yeah? So when you speak to somebody, there might be a group of three, you might address the most senior person. Or if there's a group of many, of many different kinds of people, you address the most senior group. So when you say bhikkhus, actually you're implying the whole audience, whoever is there, including bhikkhus or whatever, uh, or lay people might be as well. Yeah, on the Uposatha days in, in ancient India, the lay people would come to the monastery specifically to uh, listen to the Dhamma. Yeah, this, this, is, um, this is actually one of the obligations for monastic to teach the lay people when they come to the monastery on the course of that day. So, there's a nice story about that, a story about uh, where the, uh, you know, the, the, what is it, the um, famous king of ancient Magadha, King Bimbisara, yeah, he uh, sees all of these uh, uh, wanderers and ascetics of various kinds of religions and on the Uposana day. The Uposana day is the day of the full moon or the day of the new moon. And on the day, they would gather together and then they would give Dhamma talks. And the lay people would come around and they would listen to these Dhamma talks. And then uh, King Bibisara seeing this, uh, kings in those days were very humble affairs. Yeah, king left in that day were probably more humble than a, a CEO of a large corporation these days. It was very kind of small time king. So, so anyway, so this king Bibisara would go to the Buddha and say, "Well, all of these uh, ascetics of other sects, they're gaining all this adherence. Yeah, they're building up a following, lay people listening to them, and yet the teachings they get to hear are not impressive. Yeah, they're building up a following, even though the teachings aren't really all that good." Shouldn't the monks of the Buddha, the bhikkhus and bhikkhus, shouldn't they be doing the same thing here? And the Buddha thinks, I don't actually, the Buddha doesn't think like this. The Buddha just kind of uh, probably knows what the answer is straight away. So the Buddha says, and the Buddha doesn't say anything because the Buddha doesn't usually respond. Yeah, when someone makes a request, the Buddha kind of remains quiet and then he makes whatever decision afterwards that he thinks is appropriate. Uh, so after King Bibisara has left, then uh, and the Buddha says to the monastic community, you too should, uh, you know, uh, get together on the Uposada days and give Dhamma talks to the lay people. Yeah? 
So then uh, uh, later on, the monastic community gets together, but they don't give a Dhamma talk. They just sit there in silence. Yeah, they don't say anything at all. And the lay people are really disappointed and they grumble and they go to the Buddha and they say to the Buddha that the monks and nuns are just sitting there like dumb pigs. And um, the Buddha is not too pleased. He doesn't want his monks and nuns to be dumb pigs. Yeah? So he, he says to his, and his monks and nuns, you should not sit there like Dhamma is uh, when the lay people come to hear Dhamma talk, you should speak the Dhamma and inspire the lay people. Yeah. So this is the ancient tradition that is actually kept to the present day, where so you know whereby we are supposed to give Dhamma talks on the post If you go to the monastery, you don't hear the Dhamma talk, you can say to the monastics, don't just sit there like a dumb pig. Yeah, give a Dhamma talk. Yeah? And then you see what happens, see what the and then you can refer to the suttas, yeah? If you know the page number, you can see here, the Buddha said it right here. And you can see, <laughs> see what happens as a consequence. So be, be gentle though, don't be, too, don't, don't be too kind of in your face with these things. So, so these are, um, so this is uh, just a, a story that came to mind. There's lots of this story. This is actually a story from the Vinaya uh, the discipline or the rules of common monastics. Uh, there's lots of little interesting stories like that there, the interaction between the ancient kings of India and the Buddha and the monastic community. There. So um, anyway, uh, getting a little bit sidetracked, but that's okay. That is the idea of mendicants and that uh, Bhante Sudrato uh, uses, which uh, just to give you an idea of why that is the case, because it is gender neutral. Uh, and uh, because it uh, gives, I think, a wrong impression of being very monk-centric. In fact, they probably were not that monk-centric. They were really open for everyone. Uh, and that is, I think, an important point to, uh, to bring out. Uh, but uh, let us move on to the next sutta. So this next sutta is uh, more about how to live well. Uh, this is from the, again, from the connected discourses of the Buddha, uh, still dealing with the devas, the uh, divine beings. Uh, this is the Devata Sangyuta, uh, number 33, uh, and this sutta is called Good. And uh, this is uh, how it goes, uh, at least the first verse. Uh, then a Devata uttered this inspired utterance in the presence of the Buddha. Good is giving, dear sir, even when there's little, giving is good. When done with faith to giving is good. The gift of a righteous gain is also good. Giving with discretion too is good. Okay, so this is... Uh, a, uh, basically a very short summary of the idea of giving on the path, yeah, the idea of generosity, and uh, it is one of the foundations of the Buddhist path. Uh, you find quite a bit in the suttas how to give in the right way, uh, uh, and uh, so it actually matters quite a lot. Yeah, and it's interesting. There is a kind of a an art to giving. And giving is not something that you just do like that. It's something that ideally you do in the right way to kind of maximize the power of that giving. So it really has an impact in your spiritual life. Yeah, maybe that sounds a bit cynical. You give it for maximum impact for yourself, but it is not really cynical because the maximum impact you think is precisely when you give it self selflessly. Yeah? So it's not about becoming selfish. It's really about just understanding how the Dhamma works. And then get much more power out of any good action you do, including giving. The thing about giving is that there are so many opportunities to give. Yeah, we can give to people almost all the time and expand the idea of giving, as we shall see in a second, also in consciousness and the way we speak to people and all of these things. But the basic idea of giving is just giving something material, yeah, bringing someone a cup of tea, yeah, or or whatever it is, tiny little things that we can do in our daily life. There's so many opportunities uh, if we actually take them. Uh. So good is giving is the starting point here. Uh. And then uh, this Devata says, even if you only have a little, giving is good. Yeah? And uh, often it is not about so much about the 
quantity that we give. It is more important to give at all than kind of to give large things. And very often it is more important to give regularly, not rather than just to give one big gift, yeah, but to get into the habit of giving. In other words, you kind of you, you learn how to give in the right way and you do it again and again and again, because then you are building up these good qualities. If, if, if giving feels good for you, it feels right. And the more you're doing it, the more you're building up the good feeling inside. So giving often is very important because it reminds you of what this, this is about. And if you're, even if you are very, not very wealthy now, you can't afford it, it doesn't matter. We can always give in small ways. Yeah, there's always little things that we can do. Even as a monk, I don't really own very much of this world, but I can often give it regardless. I can do little services for people, give it in, in more subtle ways than is uh, possible uh, for lay people, or which is possible for everyone. So giving little, giving often is really the most important thing. And the attitude that you bring into it matters enormously. So look for opportunities of giving. Yeah, Look if there is an opportunity here. How can I be of service? Uh, how can I add this here, which I may never have even thought of before? What other little things I can do? Opening the kind of just hold, opening a door for someone, or uh, you know, in monastic life, we wash each other's bowls, or we kind of hand you just hand something to somebody. They don't have to stretch, or you bring them a glass of water, or whatever. Yeah, you see someone needs a hand, and you rush to give them a hand straight away because you know the power of that. And of course, the other people is also very happy when they when you. Uh, they get that kind of support from the people. There's so many opportunities in daily life. Uh, and if we take all of those opportunities, uh, then uh, we're going to be on the highway to awakening, uh, because this is really such a part of this. Uh, uh, and I will show you in a second one of the reasons why this is so powerful is because there is a very high degree of selflessness in the idea of giving. It's very closely related to the idea of selflessness in the, as a broader perspective on the path. Then he says, uh, when done with faith too, giving is good. Yeah, faith is another aspect of giving that is, that is positive. In other words, faith here, sadha, confidence, you have confidence in something, yeah? So you have confidence perhaps in a, a Buddhist institution, yeah, the Sangha or uh, some other Buddhist institution or Buddhism in general or whatever it may be. And when you have a strong sense of confidence that this institution is doing something good for the world, uh, helping people out, reducing suffering in the world, increasing happiness, yeah, not only in a small sphere but in a large sphere, then of course that confidence means that the mindfulness is stronger, the joy is greater, all of these things come together and it becomes very powerful when you give with confidence. With your confidence, there's no reluctance anymore. The reluctance is gone. You just automatically give of something. And I often think of the sort of things that we are doing here in Perth, for example, you know, the kind of uh, like uh, Ajahn Brahm, for example, when he gives a Dhamma talk at, uh, uh, the, at, at, at uh, uh, Nolamara, the city centre here. And sometimes these books are listened to by millions of people there. Yeah, there are millions of people that benefit from these Dharma teachings. And uh, one of the things, if you kind of uh, support someone like Ajahn Brahm, yeah, or the Sangha here, or, or even the broader of Buddhism, what you are supporting, you're supporting these teachings going out to millions of people. And there are lots of people who benefit enormously from these teachings, yeah, who find themselves uplifted, who find themselves getting out of depression and sadness, and, people getting good meditation as a consequence of these things, yeah? And anyone who gives to that has a piece of that action. Yeah, when you give, you have a piece of this whole thing, keeping this Buddhism alive, keeping it going. And every time someone has a good meditation, every time someone is succeeding in getting out of a negative mind state, but because you have given towards that, you have a part of that. Yeah, you're helping spreading happiness in the world, reducing suffering in the world. That's kind of marvelous, isn't it? When you think about it like that, it's this broad idea of what generosity does. It doesn't just give to a single person or a single organization. What you're giving is to this thing which has this ripple effect going out into the entire Buddhist world, even beyond the Buddhist world. 
just a marvelous thing. And thinking about these things in the right way is often the trick to even getting more satisfaction and happiness out of them. Now. So giving with confidence is good, yeah? Understanding what you're doing, yeah? The gift of righteous gain is also good. Yeah? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, what that means is that when you have earned your money through hard work or through hard, whatever it is, and, yeah, and you have, you've really earned whatever it is that you are giving away, the money, the livelihood, whatever it might be. If you feel it is really yours and you have earned it, then when you're give, giving it, it feels like you're real giving. You're giving of yourself. It is a real sense of letting go. That is why it is really powerful. Yeah. But if you have, you know, if you have been a bit dodgy and you have cheated someone and you have gained some money or whatever in a dodgy way, then of course, when you give it, it doesn't feel like it is really yours to give anymore in quite the same way. It wasn't really yours in the first place, and you don't get the same kind of happiness from it. So uh, for that reason, if you have really worked hard for something, yeah, <laughs> then giving it is actually much more powerful. Uh, it's interesting. It's kind of, kind of obvious when you think about it. Uh, but uh, you know, anyone who thinks that they're going to steal to give and then gain the same kind of merit, actually, it doesn't work like that. It's impossible. Uh, it is when you have done something properly that is really powerful. Uh, giving with discretion, too, is good. Uh, and discretion here really means like uh, after reflection, uh, yeah, reflecting on it, uh, thinking about it in the right way. Um, what is the right time to give? Yeah? When are things needed? What is the right things to give? What is appropriate to give? If let's say that you're going to give something to monastics, what is right? Should I give a Rolls Royce or should I give a meal? Okay. So you, you give a meal, right? You don't give a Rolls Royce to a monastic. Some people do give Rolls Royce to a monastic, but it's not giving with discretion. It's giving with silliness. You're silly if you give something so fancy to a monastic. But uh, in a world where there is a lot of wealth and there is a lot of uh, confidence, sometimes silly confidence, uh, yeah, in uh, the uh, uh, in monastics or in Buddhism or whatever, often these things happen. People just give in an unreasonable fashion. So you give what is required for monastics to survive. If you want to give to monastics, that is what you give. You look at what is the requirement. You don't go over the top so that you start destroying what you are giving to. It, sometimes it becomes like, oh, I need to make merit, so I will give regardless. But actually, there isn't that much merit if you just give regardless without thinking about it. Thinking about it, having discretion, using your wisdom is part of the idea of making merit and good karma. Yeah, you're reflecting on it. You're really taking an interest. And of course, all of this thinking about it uh, and making something out of it, uh, it needs more intention. It needs more, it's more, like, more um, turning it over in your mind. And for that reason, it's going to have a greater impact. And you're going to think about it and be more happy about it later on. Uh. So give with care. Uh, give wisely. Uh, yeah? Understand what is required. But help that we can with whatever your strengths might be. Uh, and by giving kind of in the right way. So uh, this, this is about giving. And uh, one of the things that uh, kind of stands out about the idea of giving is that some of the vocabulary that is used for words to do with giving is often, a lot, is the same kind of vocabulary you find for awakening. Yeah? In the second noble truth, uh, you find the second noble truth uh, the third noble truth, rather, uh, third noble truth is about the awakening experience and giving up of craving. Uh, and the way it is described is as the four words are used uh, to explain that experience. Uh, there's chaga, yeah, chaga, which means like relinquishing. Uh, there's muti, muti is like freeing. Uh, yeah. There is pati nisaga which is like also relinquishing, and then it's analaya, which is uh, like non-clinging or something like that. Uh, and the first three of those four words are also words that are found in regard to generosity. Uh, yeah, Shaga, giving out, giving up. Uh, Patinisaga, there's another word called bosaga, which is very close to related, which means like, again, relinquishing, giving out. Uh, and mutti, uh, like mutti, uh, mutti chaga, 
freely giving, yeah, is again one of those words. Uh, so it's kind of fascinating that the word for words for generosity are quite closely related to the words for awakening. Yeah. Why might that be the case? What is going on there? And uh, the answer is that uh, the idea of giving something of yourself, yeah, of letting go of something, uh, uh, not clinging to things, is exactly the same idea that you do when you reach awakening. It's just a much more basic form of the same general process. So when you give, it's like a small awakening, a tiny awakening, because you're letting go of something. You, you are no longer holding on to it or clinging to it. Uh, this is only a small, relatively small matter, but the principle is the same when eventually you let go of all of the five kantas. So there's a tiny taste of awakening. And if you have ever given with a mind where you really have this kind of urge to give, this feeling of kind of benevolence towards the whole world, yeah, you really kind of almost like something opens up inside of you and you just want to give, yeah. And if you've had that experience, and I'm sure many of you will have had that experience occasionally, yeah, it's, it is so powerful, yeah. You know that this is a very has to be a very powerful spiritual feeling. If this is really spirit, this is kind of leaning in the right direction. Then. And you can feel how beautiful that act actually is when you have a very strong sense of wanting to give and wanting to let go inside of you. You just want to give almost to anyone. It's this opening up of the heart. And of course, when the Buddha describes the entering to Samadhi, and especially when he talks about the becoming a stream enter down the track, he says that that perfection of generosity is one of the foundations, is one of the things that you have to have to be able to enter into Samadhi. That kind of mind state is just like that. It's a very open mind state where you just want to give, yeah, this very powerful sense of wanting to share it with the whole world. That is the, what is required to become a, enter Samadhi or to become a stream enter. So that is one of the factors we can look for, yeah? If someone is really awakened or not, are they selfish and stingy or are they just incredibly open-handed and open-hearted, wanting to give to everyone? Yeah? That is one of the ways of uh, kind of uh, making a, it's not good to judge too much, but if you want to kind of judge a little bit, I, mean, I guess we have to sometimes, that is one of the factors to look for. Yeah? So giving is very uh, important on the path, but uh, and uh, this is what comes next in the sutta, is that there is a higher kind of giving. It is giving in terms of general generosity, if you can take it further. Uh, yeah? So this Devata then says, and further, restraint towards living beings is also good. One who harms no living beings, uh, who does no evil from fear of criticism, uh, in that they praise the coward, not the brave, uh, for the good uh, do no evil out of fear. So the higher kind of giving is the giving of fearlessness to the world. Yeah, with, the, with other beings that can feel that in your presence they are safe. They are safe not only in the sense that you won't harm them or kill them, but they're also set safe in the sense that uh, 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 you won't steal from them, you won't take from them, you won't cheat on them in any way, you won't lie to them, you won't do any of these kind of things. Uh, so this is an even higher gift yeah, than the giving of material things, because here what you're doing is giving psychological ease to the people around you. Uh, they will feel at ease around you, they will know that you are trustworthy, they will know that in your company they can Ooh, breathe, yeah, relax, no need to kind of be tense, you don't have to kind of not walking on eggshells or anything like that in your company. They know they can be at ease or comfortable around you. And what a wonderful thing that is to be able to just really breathe out easily around people because you know that uh, when you're with them, you are okay, you are fine. So this little verse here, in, you know, one of the things that you have here is the idea of doing you no know, evil from fear of criticism. And sometimes you might do evil because you are afraid other people might look down on you or criticize you. There is pressure to do bad things, yeah? And because you are afraid of what other people might think of you, then you might give in to that pressure and you might do bad things yourself as a consequence. You know, you get born in a mafia family and the mafia family says, you must kill, you must steal. 
And then you do it because it is very hard to resist it. the uh, mafia families. Yeah, they are very powerful. But they can they can pay and do what they say. Yeah. But uh, you don't do that. Uh, you don't. Uh, you're not a coward in that sense. You don't do things simply because uh, you are afraid. Uh, so you're you're established. You're strongly determined to live in the right way. Uh, and if you have to, and if you feel the pressure of someone to. And for you to do the wrong thing, then probably what you do is you don't hang out with those people anymore. You understand these are Papa Mita, Papa Mita, they are bad friends. And you don't hang out with those bad friends anymore. Yeah. Again, this idea of having good friends on the spiritual path. Yeah. But here we are upping, we are upping the ante a little bit. Yeah. We are kind of um, making generosity into something more than really yeah, of giving. But giving psychological ease to people. And one of those aspects of giving, which I think is very, uh, very beautiful way of thinking about giving, is to give people the gift of your kind speech. Remember the ideal of kind speech in the sutta as a right speech. First of all, not lying, of course. And not lying doesn't mean just not lying, it means actually being really truthful, being honest, really direct about things. Not at the wrong time, but at the right time. So you, there is no sense of deceiving people at all. Uh, remember, there's two opposites here. One is actually outright lying, but the other one is speech, which is very open and honest. You don't hide things because you are embarrassed about things, because you want to yourself might get injured or whatever. You're sometimes you are embarrassed about your faults, but you also realize everyone makes mistakes. Okay. I'm not going to try to hide these things, yeah? And you're open about things. So. You bring people together, yeah? You draw people together, you create harmony in the world because you know the importance of harmony, the second quality of right speech, yeah? And uh, again, it is very beautiful when that happens, uh, yeah? When, when you kind of, this, the world is so divided, we're always fighting with each other, there's so much uh, conflict going on everywhere. And we can be the agents of harmony instead, bringing people together. Well, how, what, what marvelous that is, uh, trying to understand things in a broader way. Yeah? I, um, I recently saw a very interesting, there was a, a, um, an article about a, a woman who was a, a member of parliament in Denmark. Yeah? Yeah? This, this lady, she... Uh, she had a Muslim background. She was Turkish originally. She came to uh, Denmark as an immigrant, or maybe she was born to immigrant parents. I can't remember now, one of those. Uh, and I was very impressed with her integrity in the way she uh, tackled a very difficult situation. Because as soon as she came into parliament in Denmark, uh, she became the target of all kinds of abuse. Yeah, You know what it is like? Is the issue of the internet, and as a parliamentarian, you have to have a Twitter account, probably, and a Facebook account. You have to reach out to people, otherwise, you can't be in politics these days. So she became a target of enormous amounts of abuse. Abuse because she was a woman, yeah, which happens quite a bit, I understand. Because she was a Muslim, minority, minority background, yeah, especially because she was a Muslim, that was one of the main things, I think. Yeah. And uh, so and initially, she said that uh, she just kind of uh, uh, dismissed it. Yeah, these are the stupid people. I don't have to deal with them. Just dismissed the whole thing. And then one day, she had a friend who was told her that, well, maybe you should do more than just dismiss it. Maybe what you should do is try to meet some of these people who are abusing you and find out who they really are. So what she did, and this is really brave and I think very uh, interesting what she did. She took the most abusive person, yeah, who was sending her the worst abuse, and she sent him a message back and said, Can, shall we go out for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this abuser, yeah, they, I think he, yeah, he, he invited her to his house, yeah, she asked. And, uh, you know, she, he had a wife and all these kind of things. And when she came to his house, uh, she found out he was just this really ordinary person, this really ordinary guy, yeah? There was nothing about him that was exciting or interesting or even evil, yeah? It would just seem so banal, everything. And I started talking about this, yeah? Why are these things going on? 
And she found out very quickly that why these things are going on is because we don't talk to each other. We don't really understand each other. Yeah, we, ha we have this idea of the other, the other which is different that we don't understand. We have no idea of their humanity. So he was kind of blind to what was going on in the Muslim world and in that parliament world. And she was also blind to what was happening with the people who had that kind of attitude. Yeah, she thought they were terrible people. Actually, it turned out to be a normal person. And so she started a creation She started the creation of building between two things that seem to be so polarized. Yeah. But once you meet people, then once you talk to them, then, once you listen with an open mind to what people have to say, it's amazing the kind of uh, gaps that you can bridge in this way. Huh? And um, so we need to be more open to each other's humanity. And when we're more open to each other's humanity, it's amazing how much harmony we can create in this world, even with people who seem to be so different from us. Yeah, deep down. Then, there is so much similarity between, between human beings. Deep down, we all want to be happy. We all want to have a world which is a good place to live. We all want to avoid fear and anxiety and all the negative things in the world. Deep down, the, the, the similarities between us as human beings are, are so great. So in this way, you are really using your speech as a gift, yeah? creating harmony in the world. Then there is a speech, of course, which is a speech of not speaking harsh words, but being gentle and saying things in the right way. Yeah. And then the last form is the you know, speech which goes to the heart, as it says in the suttas. Uh, and the last one is the speech of speaking things that aren't, aren't meaningful, but, yeah, things that have to do with the, the teaching, uh, have to practice these teachings. Uh, these are the four kinds of right speech. Uh, but uh, we have to remember the four kinds. Uh, just ask yourself, uh, how am I speaking? Uh, is this speech going to the heart of other people? Uh, is it speech that, that does something to their life in a positive way? Is it a gift to the other people? Or am I detracting from their existence with the way I speak to them? Uh, and then when you bring meaning into the well, then the potential for giving gifts to the world is even more expanded. Yeah, almost every time you open your mouth, you have the potential for giving a gift, sending out a flower to somebody, yeah, doing something positive in this way. Yeah. So, uh, so this is how then you expand all of these things. Yeah. And then uh, let's just carry on with the last verse here. Then another Devata said to the Buddha, which one, blessed one, has spoken well? Yeah, the devatas, they are being praised by the Buddha. They are going to see that the Buddha really understands what is going on. And then the Buddha replies in this customary way, you have all spoken well in your own way, but listen to me too. Surely giving is praised in many ways, but the path of Dhamma surpasses giving. For in the past and even long ago, the good and wise ones attained extinguishment, the Nibbana. Yeah, this is all important. It always takes things to the highest level. And uh, uh, you will notice here that he doesn't say that giving is a lesser kind of uh, spiritual factor. What he says is that the path of Dhamma surpasses giving. So giving is there, it's part of it, but you need to go beyond that. Yeah, you need to go um, to do more than just giving. But giving never stops. Giving goes all the way to becoming an Arahant. The greatest givers in the world are the Arahant. So giving always comes along, but you need to do more. That is really what the Buddha is saying here. It is not as if giving is for inferior spiritual people, not at all. Giving is for the true saints as well. And then he goes on to say that the thing that we really should do in this world is the good and the wise ones, they attain extinguishment. Yeah, that is the purpose of all of this. That is where we're heading. And all of these other things are uh, uh, critical. They are absolutely fundamental if you want to attain that extinguishment. But then you go beyond, you use that power, power you have attained through your practice, uh, the power of kindness and the power of the joy and the happiness that you gain through that. Uh, and you, 
uh, you amplify it, you amplify it through the meditation practice and bring out even more powerful happiness and joy until eventually you can go all the way to the heart and attain that extinguishment yourself. Anyway, there you are, just a couple of fairly simple suttas just on uh, uh, the ideas of uh, kindness and generosity, yeah, uh, just to sort of strengthen the foundations on the path a little bit, and, and we're going to look a little bit more about these things also uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning especially, and then we will come back to the uh, path again, the kind of the development of the mental quality further down the track. But uh, now is probably a good time to do some questions. Uh, yeah. So, are there any questions today or what's... Yes, yes, yes. Some questions have already come okay. and I'm sure okay. that more will follow. So, um, how would you define giving as opposed to someone just being exploited and used and held in contempt by the person or colleagues they're giving to? Um, you have, I mean, giving has to, you have to do it with wisdom. Yeah? And if you feel that you are being exploited or held in contempt, then uh, it doesn't feel very nice to give. Yeah? So you, you, uh, you don't get the same joy out of it in that particular case. So, uh, so sometimes if you really feel that, then probably it's probably better to find another um, place to give, give to someone else instead of someone who is more appreciative, yeah? Or uh, what you also should do if someone is contemptuous, then sometimes you just have to give in a slightly different way, yeah? You have to find another way of giving to them. Maybe give, give to them through speech instead, yeah? give to them by saying something kind. Everyone is open to kindness in certain ways, but uh, you just have to find the right trigger point for that particular person, yeah? How do they operate? How do they function? And then you can always find a way of giving something to them. But it's always important to protect ourselves. So give with wisdom. Don't give in a way which doesn't feel right. Yeah, the whole purpose here is to build up good qualities. So be discerning and be careful in how you do these things. And then uh, you will you will always find I think you'll find a way of doing this, which is. Uh, uh, you know, which works out to your benefit, also to the benefit of the other person. Yeah. Great. So there's a question about Pali. Um, for someone living in Germany, can you make any recommendations for learning some Pali? <laughs> uh, yes, are you really sure you want to learn Pali? 100% sure? Yeah, maybe. Um, I, and, you know, it, if you are a person, if you have a lot of extra time, yeah, if you are a person who uh, has the time to do it, great. And I think as a monastic, I think learning Pali is very useful if you have the aptitude for languages and that sort of thing, I think is a great idea. But if you are already very busy, I would be careful to learn Pali because you're going to find that it detracts from so many of the other things that you have to do. Yeah, It just becomes too much sometimes. Uh, but if you are in a situation where you have the uh, space and the, you know you, you can learn Pali on top of all the other things that you are doing, then please go ahead. Yeah, you may you may find it inspiring. Some people find it really inspiring. So how? Do that? And the one thing you can do is you can listen to my <laughs> teachings on Pali. Maybe I don't know if you if you want to do that. If you you can try my teachings anyway on Pali and see if that works for you. Maybe you find them terrible. If you find them terrible skip them straight away, don't listen to them, but you can give them a shot that way. And uh, there is a, a website called Wisdom and Wonders, yeah? Wisdom and Wonders website. And if you go to that website, it has a beautifully divided up teachings on uh, uh, Pali teachings based on a book which is called Introduction to Pali. The book called Introduction to Pali, it is a book authored by a scholar called A.K. Water, A.K. Water, W-A-R-D-E-R, W-A-R-E-D-R, A.K. Water, uh, Introduction to Pali. And uh, these lessons are that I teach based on that book. And, so you find that. and uh, that is one way that I would uh, 
personally, I, I think, you know, yeah, try, try that out anyway, see if that works for you. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, I would, if I were you, you can just uh, go on the internet. There are many monks, nuns perhaps as well, I'm not sure, some lay people probably as well who do teach Pali, and there are resources available on the internet, uh, yeah? So look around a little bit. Uh, I think mean, people like Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, he teaches Pali. Um, and I think there's a lay person called John Kelly who teaches Pali. And then uh, you should be able to find resources on the, on the internet. Uh, but of course, I'm a little bit attached to my own uh, teaching of Pali. So uh, try, try it out. Just see if that works. And if that doesn't work, then uh, uh, look around for other things. Uh, so, but be careful not to overdo it, yeah? It is more important to get access to the suttas and at least a little bit of English to reflect on those suttas. And sometimes you learn Pali and it may take a long time before you really know it well enough to be helpful. So be wise about this so that you don't kind of, it becomes a, a distraction in your practice. Okay. Dear Ajahn, is mental sila, that's Indriya Samvara sila, mainly developed by the four right efforts? Replacing unwholesome thoughts sometimes feels like fighting. How to deal with this skillfully in daily life? Okay. Yes, it can be like fighting. And the reason it is like fighting is because we're trying to push them out. Yeah. And when you push them out, they're going to come back again. And then you push them out again and they come back. And this is called using willpower to overcome the unwholesome thoughts. So, yeah, this is like, a, that's, that's fighting. Fighting is using willpower. So uh, the idea is that instead of using willpower to overcome the unwholesome thoughts, it is far better to use wisdom, to use your reflective powers instead. When, uh, it's, when we talked about substituting good thoughts, uh, 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 good thoughts for bad ones, uh, yeah, putting the good thoughts in where the bad ones were, you have to be very careful. You don't just force, make a forced substitution where you're kind of playing with thought on top of the bad one. It has to be something that comes quite naturally. So that substitution should come not through willpower, but through a change in your perception. And if you change your perception about what is going on, then the change of thinking will happen automatically as a consequence. So let me give you an example. Yeah, you, for example, you are you have some ill will towards somebody, yeah, because they have said something to you which is really insensitive and bad. And they have said that you know, I, whatever it is, you know, people say insensitive things all the time, and sometimes for whatever reason, that's just the way the world is. So uh, then you check, uh, and of course, when we feel we are the victim of these things, it is very easy to get a bit upset, yeah, to have a bit of ill will even because we feel the other person isn't treating us the right way. And then you remind yourself, actually, it probably has nothing to do with me. Yeah, it's not really about me. It's actually about the other person. They are saying this because of their own inner conditioning, their own inner state. I happen to be here at this time and place around them. The conditions are such that I have happened to bear the brunt of this, what they are saying. But if another person like me had been in the same position, they would have to bear this, the same problem. Yeah. So we, if you think about it in the right way, it's like, really, actually it's got nothing to do with me. It has to do with the other person. They are speaking like this because of their own inner conditioning, because of their own bad habits, basically. They are the one who have the problem, not me. And once you get that, you realize that the idea of anger doesn't make any sense. Yeah? If, because anger only makes sense if you are hurt. Yeah, if you feel it is personal, it is about me, then the, the idea of anger kind of, kind of makes sense, even though it is not such a good idea. But if it is not about you, if it is just about the other person being who they are, the inner conditioning coming out, they are like a robot, been conditioned in a certain way, now it's come, that program is acting and it's coming out of them, yeah? If you saw a robot, you know, like a little robot kind of rolling along the floor and the robot says, you know, I hate you, you are terrible, you are bad. How would you react? Would you get angry at the robot or would you laugh because the robot is so ridiculous? You probably laugh, right? I think, what is this, ro what is this robot doing? 
you're sending this thing, someone has programmed the robot, you don't get angry with the robot uh, unless you are in a bad mood already, you might kick the robot if you do that. But uh, otherwise, you, you wouldn't do anything. And, and human beings, they are like that. Yeah, we are a bit like robots. So think of the human being as kind of this robot walk, walking on two feet, saying things that are programmed into their mind. They cannot stop themselves because of the program. And then when you see them saying bad things, you might, you might kind of laugh. Yeah, don't laugh now, just laugh inside of yourself, of course, otherwise you make things worse. <laughs> and then you, you don't take this thing seriously anymore because you know it's not about you. It's about the inner demons in that person. They are the one who have the problem. They are the ones who are going to have to bear the coming consequences of their bad speech or bad conduct yeah, in the long term. They are the ones who are, who, who are the problem here. And then you can start to even have compassion for that person. You can think, wow, they really do have a problem. I wonder what's going to happen to them down the track. I can deal with this. It's not such a big problem for me, but they have to carry this around all, all the time. Or I might remember this at the moment when they die, especially if they do this a lot. Gee, I hope they get out of this. Maybe I can help them to get out of this. And then you kind of give them a pat on the shoulder, say, oh, yeah, it's okay. You know, don't worry. Things will be okay or whatever. And you turn things around. Instead of getting upset by somebody's sin or badness, whatever you want to call it, you actually have compassion for them instead. This is what I mean by substituting your thoughts. You are giving rise to a new perception, a different way of looking at the situation. Then substitution happens. Substitution does not happen through an act of will. It happens through an act of wisdom. When you look at the world, you look at people in a new way. You just have to see them differently. The big problem here is that we tend to think of people as having freedom of will. Yeah, this person is doing this out of their own free will. They're harming me because they want to harm me. They are bad people. They should not be doing this. So this is how we tend to think about people. But people don't really have that much free will. Yeah, they are pre-programmed. They're just running on that program. So don't believe this delusion of the free will. It feels like it, but actually it is essentially just an illusion. You know, we are, we are programmed to be the way we are. And it can't really be any other way than that. And then you can start to have compassion for those who have a bad program. If you run around with a bad program, all you're doing is creating bad karma for yourself and leading to more suffering. And boy, you have a bad program in you. You know, I, I sh I'm going to have more compassion for you because of that bad program that you're running on. Uh, and then you, you know, you're heading in the right direction when you think like that. Uh, that is what substitution is. Uh, there is more, and this is only one way that the Buddha talks about giving up the bad thoughts. Substitution is one of them. Then he talks about thinking about the bad consequences of thinking. Yeah, and I think, wow, this is going to hurt me, hurt others, and all this kind of thing. Then there is the idea of just uh, forgetting the bad thought, yeah, not paying attention to it, just paying attention to something else. And then there's the idea of uh, uh, just watching the thought and not buying into it and allowing it to peter around, uh, yeah, not to, uh, adding fuel to the fire, so to speak. And then there's the fifth way, and the fifth way is using willpower. The fifth, the last, when you're absolutely desperate, uh, you're just about to kill someone and you want to have to hold back, no, Oh, I must not kill that is the right time to use willpower, yeah? Hold back that killing instinct inside of you because that is a really bad instinct when that happens. So then you have a whole arsenal of weapons to deal with the, the bad thoughts. Yeah, use wisdom power, don't use willpower. That is what right effort is about. Indriya Sanvara Sila, the the virtue of restraining the senses, indriya, senses, sanvara, restraint, sila, the virtue, is a virtue that uses wisdom more than it uses willpower. And if you read the suttas carefully, you will see that again and again and again. The idea of being wise about this. Sir. Yeah, then it starts to change your way you think about people, the, the way you look at the world, and it becomes incredibly powerful after a while. After a while, you don't really get angry so much anymore. Yeah, it kind of everything just kind of, you know, you shrug your shoulders and you carry on, and it doesn't really hit you in the same way because you look at the world in a new way. Yeah? This is real power. If you keep on just trying to suppress these things, and if you try to use force to avoid these things, well, you don't really get very far because you have to apply the force again and again and again. What you have to do is change your outlook. 
you have to think in a new way, that is when it becomes powerful. Then. So that is really what this is about. I was going to talk. Yes, actually, I will. I think tomorrow I'm going to talk about this in, in more detail, how to overcome uh, uh, ill will in general. So, to, so please come back tomorrow, and we're going to have a, a longer discussion of this particular point too. So there's quite a lot of questions coming in, Ajahn. Uh, okay, another one about generosity. Um, I've met numerous people who at the beginning seemed friendly and very generous with time and resources. Over time, their negative qualities become obvious, like possessiveness and rudeness. These experiences make me suspicious of people's intentions and create ill will. What is your opinion, please? Um. Yes, I, I think that is probably true. That that, that you know is a, not that common to find people who are truly generous in a very in a very profound and deep way. I mean, the, the more deep the spiritual quality is, the more rare it is going to be in the world. Yeah, and, and most people are going to be possessive to some extent. That is just the extension of our senses of self and our ego is being possessive. Yeah? So you have to be you have to be careful and yeah? you have to you have to know you know you have to be very discerning and not kind of uh, jump to conclusions too quickly about whether someone is truly good or not. Uh, so, but, but I guess my thing here is don't worry too much about what other people do. Yeah, uh, choose your friends carefully. Choose your colleagues. Just focus more on your own conduct. Yeah, because that you can do something about. You know, you can do something about your own life. Uh, so ask yourself whether you are doing generosity in the right way. Ask yourself what you can do about these things in your life. Yeah, that is really a critical issue for your own spiritual advancement. And then also people with honesty. Okay, they may be generous, but they may also be, be a, a possessive. And sometimes, uh, sometimes what we have to do is we have to rejoice in the good qualities of person. We are so complex as people. We have good sides, we have bad sides. Uh, rejoice in the good sides, uh, but also be wary of the bad qualities at the same time. Uh, and remember that uh, we are all trapped to some extent by our bad qualities. Uh, yeah? We don't choose those bad qualities. We usually inherit them from a deep past, etc. So the more you see that, the more you can also forgive them. You can forgive bad qualities while rejoicing in the good ones and also making sure that you look after yourself and don't kind of put yourself in the firing line, so to speak, of those bad qualities. So if you, because it is painful to be around people with, uh, uh, who, have, who, has this kind of, who have this kind of qualities. Okay. okay, a few meditation questions as well. So nine years ago, when I just started meditation after following Ajahn Brahm's teachings, I went into a deep samadhi state, which left a deep imprint in my mind, which I remember like yesterday. Then I stopped meditation completely and carried on with life, but certain weird life situations lead me to start meditating again one and a half years ago with a deep trust in the Buddha's teachings. However, this deep samadhi experience tends to pop into mind every time I have some peaceful meditation and the slightest note of this memory takes me out from the peaceful meditation. Can you please advise? Yeah, you just have to remember that, uh, you know, we are, we are not here to recreate the past. Yeah, We're here to move forward. We're here to kind of do something else. So you just... Uh, and this is the biggest problem, a very, very big problem in meditation, that we try to recreate something we had before. Right? But you don't, you never recreate what happened before. You're never going to have exactly that experience again. You may have other happy experiences, but they're very unlikely to be exactly the same. Right? So you just have to feel that experience. You have to instead enjoy whatever you have now. Every little moment of peace that you have, just enjoy it. It is great. Don't even... Uh, so you, yeah, stay, just stay with what you have now, enjoy what you have now, then you're going to somehow be able to let go of these things. Remember that these things are out of control, yeah? And if you understand this thing profound, that these things are out of control, you don't know what exactly are the conditions that bring them about. It is not you who bring them about, yeah? They, they happen if you 
let go of the past and you do things in the right way and you just relax, then sometimes they happen because the conditions are right. And then after a while, when you get that, there's nothing to do with you, then you get out of the way. You don't get excited because you there's no guarantee at all that it's going to happen. Yeah, You don't kind of think about it at all. Huh? So just learn to enjoy what you have. Huh? Learn to just be with every piece that you have. Huh? Never even, and then it gets a bit better and enjoy that. Huh? But uh, don't, never go beyond the enjoyment of what you have in the moment. Uh, and gradually, that will work on you. Uh, no, no, that is none of your business where this meditation is going. Uh, and you're never going to have that past years again anyway. Uh. Okay. Thanks, Ajahn. So, dear Bante, in relation to the arising of PT due to virtuous acts, as you mentioned this morning, from time to time when my heart really connects with what I'm hearing, I get a welling up of joy that brings me to tears. Is this the same PT arising when listening to Dhamma, or am I getting over sentimental about it? <laughs> yeah, it, it can be. Yeah, I mean, you know, PT and gladness manifest in a number of different ways. Yeah, and a number of different intensities. And, yeah, so if you are feeling gladness in this way or PT in this way, great. Yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful. And. Uh, you know, you can use that to develop that in your, you can bring that perhaps even into your meditation, if you will. Yeah, and then kind of, uh, because that is almost like a recollection of, of uh, the positive qualities and of, of the Dhamma of yourself or whatever. Bring that into your meditation and see how it works. Um, so very often it's a matter of trial and error, yeah, to see what are the kind of ideal states of mind that, uh, promote a deep sense of happiness, a deeper sense of peace. So try to bring it into your meditation, try to use it, you know, you, when you're with the breath, sometimes you need to add something to bring the PT up and to bring the happiness up in the meditation. And then something can just be a little nudging of the mind, a little memory, bring this into your awareness very briefly, and then try and carry on with the breath meditation with that positive nudging of the mind at the same time. And then when you get the joy and the breath coming together, that's when it starts to become very powerful and, and beautiful. So if you are experiencing this madness, that is marvelous, that is exactly what you want. And now you just have to try to develop it further and specifically develop it. So I think we lost a few words at the end, but I think you said to try to develop it further, more specifically with the breath, is that right? Yeah, something like that. Great, okay. okay. So dear Ajahn, to develop Samadhi, where is the balance between relaxing and letting go versus making effort to keep the mind focused on the object, i.e. developing the jhana factors of Vitaka Vichara? Thank you. Okay, I, you don't need to develop the drama factors of the Taka Vichara because uh, you don't need to develop the thinking mind, it's already overdeveloped. You need to let go of the Taka Vichara, basically. It's not something that you need to develop. The, 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 uh, you know, the ideal thing is that um, to let go as much as possible, yeah? and, but the, the, nothing is really ever absolutely ideal. The ideal way for meditation to happen is that you just relinquish things, you give things up, you, uh, you abandon the central realm, you, you, uh, your mind is directed towards the idea of giving up. That is kind of the ideal way of doing meditation. And if your mind is directed towards that, then you don't really have to force the mind onto the meditation object because it naturally wants to hang out with something that is simple. It wants to give up the world. And that is why the right view, the right reflection, having the right values, all of these things matter so enormously because this is what makes your mind stick with a meditation object. So um, you have to, I guess you had to experiment a little bit. Uh, but generally speaking, the less you do, yeah, the less force you use in the meditation, the less you hold on to the meditation object, the better it is because the more peaceful you will tend to be. And sometimes, you know, you, you meditation is not going to go well, you want to start for a, you know, for a long period of time. And, and then you come to the end of the meditation, and you, you ask yourself what's going on, why was I thinking so much? 
And then that very question of why at the very end there will then give you some insight into what you were doing wrong. Your mind was guided in the wrong direction. You were uh, valuing the wrong things. Yeah, the, you were th thinking about the world. The world somehow is interesting or positive or, or whatever it is. And that is really the problem there. So uh, you want to minimize the, uh, uh, the effort. Uh, you want to just enjoy the meditation as much as possible. Making effort almost always unpleasant, uh, especially if you have to hold on to the breath. Uh, yeah? The less you do, the more pleasant the meditation tends to be. Uh, so uh, uh, the balance is what works for you ultimately. Uh, but uh, with the uh, uh, trying, if you're going to err, err on the side of minimizing the effort, uh, because it's a more pleasant step. It's very important to make the meditation pleasant because meditation takes a long time to uh, give results. You want to be doing this for years and years into the future. Huh? So, uh, yeah. But uh, Vitaka and Vichara are not things that you need to develop. They're more like things that you need to gradually abandon. Yeah? They're, they're not things that actually need to be they're always there anyway, you know, you have to, to use them. And yeah, it's more important to abandon them than to develop them. Mm. Yeah, the sound is a little bit um, breaking up, Ajahn, but um, I think we can probably string most of it. Together. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So even when I feel very calm and my attention naturally goes to the breath, I cannot observe the breath without controlling it. Do you have any advice for this problem? Thank you so much. Yeah, so this is very similar to the previous problem. Yeah, you have to use effort to hold on to the breath, but it's also a kind of control. Yeah, using effort, people do all kinds of things. They would count the breath, for example. They would count the breath forward and backwards. They can't count it one way. And uh, all those things are ways of controlling the breath so that you're able to hold on to it and not lose it. Uh, and every time you do that, there would be a sense of uh, displeasure. It would not feel nice. It would feel a bit tight here and not really at ease. Yeah. And so the, the answer to all of these questions is really that you need to build up more mindfulness beforehand. Yeah. You have to have a mind that has more clarity to it, that is more present, that is more aware, whereby your attention, your natural attention is in this moment. And you don't really have to force the mind anymore. That is really the critical issue here, is to give rise to that mindfulness. And um, uh, sometimes it can be very difficult in daily life, yeah? Especially in daily life to have mindfulness because there are just so many things going on. The mind is often a little bit too tired because of all the activity it is and all of that sort of stuff. So sometimes it may not work. It may, it may be very hard to do the breath meditation. It's a very subtle kind of meditation. So maybe if it is too hard in daily life, skip mindfulness of breathing in daily life. Do something else instead. Do a bit of meta. Do a bit of just kind of present moment awareness, just relaxing and being with the present moment. Yeah, allowing the mind to drift a little bit. Do some kind of reflection meditation about the nature of the, the world. Uh, do something else. Use a guided meditation by someone who you trust and you feel at ease with, yeah? who then can kind of put your mind on track in the right way. Uh, and this can be, can be very useful. But in the moment, uh, answer that you need more mindfulness. And mindfulness is basically built up through all of the previous factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. That is where mindfulness comes from. Uh, mindfulness is a result of the yeah. You just have to meditate a lot, and as you meditate, you build up the muscle of mindfulness. But there isn't much evidence that that is the case. Mindfulness comes through kindness, not by trying to build it up, forcing yourself to be mindful, because you have to want to be mindful. You have to want to be present. And wanting to be present comes when you feel good about yourself. It is not something you can force. It is not a habit that you just have. It is something that arises out of the right conditions. And uh, that is exactly what the Noble Eightfold Path shows you. Yeah? This idea of building up the virtue, first of all, then the mindfulness happening, happening and then out of that mindfulness coming the samadhi, the, uh, the unification of the, of the mind. So um, 
yeah, I, it is very, very tricky. And I know a lot of people are having this precise difficulty. So uh, I think very often the answer, another answer to this question is to meditate at the right time. Yeah, when, the, when your mind actually is fairly clear already. And uh, that can often mean doing a meditation practice early in the morning when you feel reasonably fresh yet, you haven't done so many things yet. It can mean that. It can also mean meditating in the right place, a place that you, where you kind of build up a certain energy where you naturally feel at peace and at ease. And it can be, as I mentioned before, doing a meditation with maybe a little bit of guidance just to remind you of what you're supposed to be doing, it makes it a bit easier for yourself. Ideally, you do the meditation just by yourself because then you are self-sustained, which is preferable. But some people like to have a little bit of guidance as well. It really depends on the person. So you try to figure out what are the conditions that give rise, that maximizes your mindfulness, yeah, to enable the meditation to happen. And if it doesn't work, try some other way of doing your meditation. Do some metta, do some guided metta meditation or just uh, be with the present moment, do some death contemplation, yeah? Death contemplation can be very useful to calm you down because you realize that nothing in this world really matters all that much. Everything is gonna change, everything's gonna disappear. Why am I so concerned with these problems when I'm gonna die? I'm gonna die soon, who knows when I'm gonna die? And yet I'm thinking about all of these problems in the world. And imagine that you are on your deathbed, how much are you gonna be concerned about the problems in the world? Nothing. You don't care less about the problems of the world because you're going to die. Yeah, this is the end of it. So there's all of these tools that um, you can use to help you to be mindful. And death contemplation is actually one of those very uh, useful tools because it makes everything in the world seem pretty insignificant and silly to uh, to worry about, basically. Okay. Um, okay. So someone's saying, thank you for your teaching. Your talk was wonderful. And the slides connecting the various aspects of the Buddha's teachings were amazing. Uh, over recent months, I've reflected in my own way on the awakening factors in the Anapanasati Sutta and how they fit together. So it was beautiful to hear you expound them in more depth. <laughs> and I was wondering, actually, Ajahn Pramali, if um, you might be able to email me those slides that show the different um, correlations of various schemes in the Buddha's teaching and then I can share them with everybody. Um, and so this Absolutely. person's saying, that's awesome, uh, that they're interested in the six, how the six recollections fit in. Um, presumably they feed faith and joy. Sorry, can I say that last thing again? Um, they were wondering um, how the six recollections fit into the sequence. Presumably okay. they feed faith and joy. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. So they, um, they, uh, and this, we're going to come to this later on, and, and they, that's exactly what they do. They give rise to that happiness, the joy that is so fundamental that you see there. And they kind of get that going, and um, they can get that going weakly or strongly, depending on your ability to uh, develop these particular things. Yeah, if you have a lot of confidence, you might get a lot of joy out of that. And, or if you have a lot of good qualities in your life and you kind of you really get off on thinking about good qualities, sometimes you don't have to really think about them. It's always almost like natural. Yeah, if you live well, you don't want to you sit down and close your eyes and you just feel good about yourself. Yeah, it kind of happens automatically. So they can lead you a, a, a long way, these reflections, or they can just get you started and then they kind of you go to the break. You bring almost like you bring that memory. Of that reflection with you onto the breath, and then you can uh, take it further from there. So it just, uh, yeah, so you are basically right in what you're saying, um, but you can experiment a little bit with that and see how far those reflections can go. Um, when we have a look at the reflections later on, uh, you will see, we were going to see more in detail how this happens, uh, but uh, essentially what you're saying is correct. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so there's two more questions, I think. We're doing well. So um, someone's asking, is the robot approach good to see your brain generating unwholesome thoughts? In other words, seeing your brain like a robot. <laughs> seeing your brain like a robot. 
yeah, yes, it is. It is good to not just see that way, also to see yourself in that way as well. It's very, very, you know, very absolutely useful because uh, uh, we all are under the delusion that we are so powerful. We can control our minds. We can think what we want and do the right thing. And yeah, we're all under that kind of. Uh, this is a massive part of that delusion of a sense of self. Uh, but a lot. But most of the time, it's just happy. It's coming up. Yeah, and we know the truth. Thing they have said before, and we react in exactly the same way. If you really have control of your mind, you would always think kind thoughts. You would always have metta. You would always have compassion. All of these kind of things. Huh? So this gives you a sense of care for yourself, compassion for yourself when you remember that, because you know that you have far less control over your mind than actually you. It feels like yeah, and what you think it might be. Huh? So, uh, and then you can forgive yourself much more easily when you understand that, yes, I made a mistake. Okay, um, let me, instead of criticizing yourself, let me think, how can I avoid that mistake in the future? Why did that mistake actually happen? The moment you criticize yourself, you are actually, you become unable to learn from what is happening because that criticism will kind of bias uh, your mind against yourself. You will have a negative uh, image of yourself and that will stop you from being able to learn yeah because you will blame yourself instead and you will just feel bad but if you can learn to forgive yourself and say oh yeah i made a mistake and just be cool about it uh, and look at it look at the causality what led to that uh, well then you can maybe start to undo those things yeah you can start to learn from it uh, so absolutely see your brain as a robot or your mind if you like as a robot uh, but also understand that that robot can be reprogrammed. Yeah? The program is not fixed. The program as you have it now, the present moment, it is fixed. But the program as you uh, develop it into the future is not fixed. So you can change in the future, even if you cannot change uh, the past. So even though what is happening exactly now might be reasonably fixed, however you develop yourself now is going to change how you uh, react in the future. Uh, then I think you are on the right track. So yes, have a lot of compassion for yourself. Yeah, And uh, often we tend to be too hard on ourselves as human beings. And we tend to think that we are, you know, we are, we should do better. But no, you shouldn't be doing better. Yeah? You're doing your very best already. Yeah? But you are trapped in your own personality. You can't step out of your own personality. Sometimes that might be a nice thing to do, but we can't. You have to do that. You have to be who you are. You have to live with your conditioning. And uh, then we become better at practicing the spiritual path if we have more love and compassion for ourselves. Okay. I miscounted, and there's still two questions, Ajahn, but um, hopefully we can fit them in. Are you good for that? Sure. Great. Uh, so, how can I reduce impatience? I feel very impatient about progressing on the path. <laughs> okay, well, uh, remember that uh, uh, impatience is not going to be very helpful. Yeah, being impatient, impatience leads to restlessness and it leads to agitation or whatever, then it's going to be not very useful. Uh, and especially in meditation practice, yeah, impatience is going to be very counterproductive. We just have to learn the exact opposite. You have to learn to be content. You have to learn to be, this is good enough. So uh, there is, a, I guess, a kind of impatience that is important, the kind of impatience um, where you understand that it is important. Yeah, the path really matters. Everything you do is important. That kind of impatience where you want to improve yourself in a certain way. And that is, a, is actually a very kind of important thing. But uh, not the kind of impatience where you it leads to some kind of unwholesome quality. And then it is no, no good. And just allowing, remember that the Buddhist path is about cause and conditions coming together. Yeah? It is about laying the foundations, doing the right thing, establishing the reason. So what really matters for the path to work is knowing the causes that will actually make the path come about. Yeah, and one of the main causes is simply listening to the Buddha's teachings, reflecting on those teachings yeah, as much as you can, and then establishing this as the framework for how you live your life. 
gradually, gradually coming about. Uh, so think in terms of cause and conditions all the time. What are the causes that are right now? Put those causes into place and then wait for, for the result of those causes to bear fruit uh, in terms of how they develop, how they actually uh, eventually down the track something will come out of the cause that you're putting in now. Uh, and uh, once you understand that nature has its own has its own speed, it has its own, you know, it, it happens according to when nature is ready, not according to what you want. Uh, you start to see that this whole impatience idea is only a hassle, it only leads to suffering for yourself. It's only a, it's a problem, really. It is not the, it's not a solution to anything. Yeah, nature happens according to nature. You cannot make a flower grow faster by pulling it. You have to allow the flower to come. And the more you reflect like that, the more you start to, I think, cool down a little bit. And then hopefully uh, your impatience will appear as a consequence. Okay, last question. So, dear Ajahn, thank you for sharing your deep wisdom and bright energy and introducing such a wonderful Kalyanamitta through his own words. This will help greatly after the end of the retreat. It was mentioned earlier that there are strong similarities between the Pali and the Chinese canons. Has any comparison been made with the Tibetan canon, please? Uh, um, yes. The Tibetan canon is quite different from the uh, uh, Pali canon, the Chinese canon. Uh, uh, the Tibetan canon uh, is not, does not have a full translation of all the suited. The uh, Chinese canon ha has pretty much a full translation of all the suttas that we have in Pali. Uh, yeah, they're very similar, very closely related. Uh, but the Tibetan only has a handful of suttas from the early Buddhist days. So Tibetan Buddhism is much more developed. It's a more, it's more of a later development of Buddhist thought. Uh, and the, the majority of things that they rely on in Tibetan Buddhism are what you would call commentaries yeah, or uh, later teachers uh, is much more prevalent in the Tibetan suttas than they are in the Pali suttas. Uh, but to those suttas that do exist in the Tibetan tradition, which are similar to the ones we have in Pali, uh, if when you look at them, they are again very similar. Yeah? They are just like the Chinese translations. Uh, they are ballpark the same uh, suttas that we have in the Pali. S some differences, of course, uh, which you would expect after having been separated for so many hundreds or thousands of years. But uh, the, mess, the main message, uh, the core teachings are exactly the same uh, in all of these traditions. So. Okay, thank you Ajahn. Um, before you leave, I just wanted to say it was a little bit harder to hear you, especially the second half of that session. I don't know if that's okay. to do with the internet or maybe other people had to use it, I don't know. But just to... Uh, yeah, just to let you know in case there's anything that can be done. But I think uh, considering that you're coming from Perth, it's probably not so bad, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for tonight. So we'll uh, thank good you night, everyone. Much. And to your mom. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Bye, bye. Everybody. Bye, Arjun. Right. So I hope that was still audible mostly and not too straining on the ears. <laughs> <laughs>